I turn around businesses that are essentially good for dead or uh, unfixable, you know, and or transitioning family businesses out of succession. Like that's really hard stuff and involves a lot of people and like emotions. And um, it's given me something I just never really had was patience, patience and, and, and understanding and compassion and just people feel those things, man. You know, and if you if you can guide people through difficult processes and be the calmest person in the room if you when you don't know if you're going to make payroll for like a hundred factory workers the next day uh 60 of them are ex-cons you know some of them for murder so like you're just like i don't know you just like if you're the calmest person everybody calms down uh, it's like being this uh an anchor you know in like a in a, in a storm on this episode of establishing your empire i host ahad gadimi over his career, Ahad has led the turnaround and transition of multiple companies. In several instances, he knew little of the industry or product before taking over. He rocketed his career when he created a swimwear line that, faster than any other company in history, went from conception to a feature in Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. The question he is always asked, how do you do it? So Ahad decided to capture it all in a book titled Turnaround Artist that has been endorsed by over 100 global CEOs. You're listening to the Establishing Your Empire show a podcast that inspires entrepreneurs, creatives, and future business owners to pursue their passions, grow their organizations, and build their empire. My name is Darren Herman, and creatively, I'm best known for my photography. But business-wise, my claim to fame is growing a company from 15K per month in online sales to breaking the $1 million a month barrier. And I'm sitting down with interesting people to talk about their process, the lessons they've learned, and how they have established their empires. All right, I got Ahad here on the Establishing Your Empire podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, I'm real excited to talk to you. Uh, we got introduced by a good buddy, Pablo Gonzalez, that was out also on this uh, on this podcast, a really good episode. So why don't we just start and why don't you give us a little background of who you are and uh, what you do? Thanks for having me. This is um, this is a lot of fun, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to to really getting to know you and um, in our exchange. Uh, so, so who am I? Uh, <laughs> I've uh, <laughs> where, where where to even start? You know, I could. Um, uh, I'm 39 years old. I, I live in Park City, Utah. I ski every day. Um, uh, I ski trees. I, I got a little bump in my head actually from a, a little accident on Friday that I've been kind of recovering from, kind of a little mild concussion. So uh, hopefully I'll be coherent in this conversation. Um, you know, when you were talking about your your podcast and you know and, and entrepreneurism or entrepreneurism, I, it's strange. I, I had like a flashback that I hadn't thought about in a very like, I don't know, like the longest time. I uh, it was like the first time I sold something, and I, and I think I was like. 12 or, or 11 and um this was like the days of dos i don't know if you remember oh, MS oh, oh yeah I, I learned on dos yeah no i i was pretty good in dos uh yeah and i was i don't know maybe more of a salesperson but um i lived in this condominium the security guard i guess he had he needed to redo his set up his dos and so i made him a copy and i sold it to him for 10 bucks and i just remember getting that first 10 bucks and being stoked. I don't know. There was this kind of a, it was a feeling that was uh, far beyond, um, you know, the, 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 the bill in my hand. And um, yeah. And since then I, you know, I started a, um, I mean, some years later, you know, I went from peddling my family's, uh, my family owns uh, French restaurants, uh, cafes across Toronto and um, well-known ones. And so my parents would bring them home to like the, the leftover bread uh, or, or pastries. And I'd, um, hawk them at you know in, in, in school i think actually that was pretty, even even earlier maybe grade two or three um uh but anyway since then you know i after after biz school i started a um actually during biz school i started a, a magazine um it's kind of like john f Kennedy jr had this magazine called george that it was its, it's whole goal was to make business uh, sorry politics sexy put sydney crawford on the cover with you know, looking like George Washington. And so I did something similar. I actually wasn't aware of George until after, but I did something similar called up and coming business journal. And it was like, 
you know, is like a finance CEO in 2005. So, you know, context setting, writing about why cannabis should legalize marijuana, you know, and this, this magazine, but, you know, national or, or, or how technology is driven by the porn industry. Just like stuff that people just didn't talk about. And, um, you know, our market was young professionals and business school students. So, um, we, we, you know, we had about 10,000 circulation on our first run and, you know, super exciting. And that led to meeting a, um, kind of like a Caribbean sultan, you know, this kind of this uh, super wealthy guy from Jamaica and he's married to this former ex-France and um, he went to invest in my magazine. I said, ah, I don't know if print is such a good idea right now. And so long story short, we started a, a swimsuit company. We started a, a bikini line. You know, he was retiring to Costa Rica. We started this line called Vito Sol. We put really sexy icons you know imagine like a, a rose or like a snake on the inside of your bikini bottom that was a whole sort of con this concept that i came up you know after you know probably too much champagne and you know too much indulgence one night you know and it's like chateau in toronto after a trip to can like you know i was 21 years old i'm like i got it we're gonna put sexy things inside the bikini bottom and he's like i love it you know and so you know we he threw two million dollars at it. Uh, we hit Sports Illustrated on our first issue, wow. and I just graduated this school, and I thought, hmm, "This is easy." <laughs> you know? So, so let's let's let me jump in real quick. So, I want to first ask about the magazine. So, I think one of the things that people have trouble with is, "Oh, I got an idea. What do I do first, or what do I do next, or how do I get started?" Right? What got you from idea to creation? Right. You know, it's interesting because you and I were just talking about this before we went on, on air about like, I was just respect, admiring you for having such a great setup and doing things so professionally. And, um, yeah, I don't know if I, I, you know, and I just, I just start with something, you know, I just kind of start with an article or start with something and, and, um, you know, it kind of snowballs. This thing started with like a 14 page newsletter. That's what it was going to be. And, uh, you know, and I had another idea, another idea. So I think it was just starting. And um, there, there's a special sort of, I don't know, I think I feel like you get like a release of energy or a special push once you just do something, you know, and, and you get some feedback, you know, you put it, you don't have to put it on the world, but you show someone, they give you some feedback, at least for I do. And so that snowball just avalanche and it was just going to be, you know, I went to um, the Rich Driver School of Business in, in uh, London, Ontario. And so that's where we kind of, we're going to do it. I'm like, well, why just our school? Why not Ontario? And so it just, it's a snowball, you know, and, and I think it starts with just doing anything, frankly. Yeah. And I would uh, recommend when that happens, when you have the idea and you, you're starting or just that energy, like you have to use it right then and there. Um, so don't go watch TV or jump on the, your computer yeah, and browse the internet because it's very fleeting. It'll be gone very, 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 very soon. But when you, when that itch happens, you know, definitely jump on it. So, so then let's talk about the swimsuit, similar story, snowball effect, you know, it sounds like, or was there something else in there? No, you know, I, I uh, uh, a bunch of things. I mean, I think like, you know, I had this, I had the stroke of inspiration, the idea, and, uh, I jumped up and I was actually hanging out, um, you know, with my buddy who would be my co-founder and, and partner and uh, financier. And he said, uh, he said, I love it. And he goes, let's tell Veronique. And that was his, you know, beauty queen wife. And of course she loved it. And it was just, so it was just like doing, and I, I think the one thing we all had in common coming back to your point was we were all just doers. Like we just, we couldn't help ourselves with the, just to do the next thing because maybe it was that energy, that excitement that you get in, it's like following a little thread and you just, you pull a little more and you pull a little more. And, uh, and I don't know, I think the world, I think so the universe conspires to help you when you do that. I think things just kind of happen, you know, uh, synchronistically, you know, we found a, a spectacular designer named Mary Teresa in, uh, in Costa Rica. She had her own swimsuit line. She was an architect. So we just said, I don't know, we're going to buy you out. You're going to design for us from now on. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, it was just like, th things just kind of happened, but I think because there was momentum to your point. Yeah. So I got to stay on the swimsuit thread a little bit because my wife is into sewing and we actually made some prototypes and some stuff, a lot of fun. Um, we just had a lot happening at that time. So we kind of paused it, but it's actually not it's just kind of on pause. 
Um, so how did you, how did you get into Sports Illustrated? Like, how did that happen? Well, so 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 we had a. I mean, this is self serving because it was like my plan, but we had a we had a really great PR strategy. So um, we were in uh, we were in Escazú, Costa Rica. This was two thousand five six, and um, we uh, we had like a whole press thing set up for the next day. No, in a couple of days in New York. And so what we did, so, you know, we hired a PR agency, a PR agent, and they were kind of making us introductions. So we got meetings, right? But before we went, we called the the National Costa Rican News and um, newspaper. And we said, look, we're doing all these things. We have Vogue, we have all these people sort of lined up, but we'll give you the exclusive if you do it tomorrow. You know, and so and we had a press release. And we're like, it has to hit before we get there. You know, and so we kind of give them a deadline. And of course, I wrote, we with the press release, we, we, we presented it the way we, we controlled the narrative, you know. And so they did it. And so when we landed, it's like, you know, it's funny because in Costa Rica, they're looking at Vogue like, wow. In Vogue, they're like, cool, these guys already hit the national newspaper, you know. And so there's some like cyclical, um, uh, uh, you know, validation there. And so we, you know, we arrived with like, you know, we're, we're like the hottest thing in Costa Rica right now. And so this thing kind of just snowballs and it's interesting, you know, people just kind of follow the leader. Once they see something is exciting, they want to be a part of it. And, um, and I think that's what happened. We got it. Uh, I remember the sports illustrated came around to our booth in, um, at the Miami swim show, um, that, that, that summer. And, um, I think we got like two pages and just to put it into context, like, I don't know. There's like lines like Shan, I think. And yeah, we'd heard that they take them eight years. And these are like real lines, nine years to get to Sports Illustrated. Because what happens is when you get to Sports Illustrated, you can get into sacks. Oh, wow. And you get the big orders. I mean, this is like 2005. Like, I don't know what it's like today, but back then, it's uh, because everyone reads the Sports Illustrated shoe. The husbands do, you know, the girlfriends see it and they want that swimsuit because they want to, you know, be like the model. So it's huge, you, you know. And then, and then what happened? So tell us the, more of the story. Like, so, so I'm guessing us in big orders, you know, where, where's the line? Oh, yeah. And also where's the line at now? But maybe give us a little bit more of the uh, journey. Yeah, yeah, we got big orders. We like, we were just on a tear. And, you know, I think, I think what was interesting about that, what we did really well with, um, was we had this like really interesting balance between like, you know, what like Richard Branson would call virgins, like people who have no idea, like no clue. But then also people who were like, man, like so experienced, they were kind of cynical. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was by design. So we brought on people who had been in the industry for 30 years and they're just like, they're just like veterans, you know? And so everything we did, it was some, between some tension of, um, you know, br things that just didn't make sense. Like we were, we, we were selling swimsuits like back then. Cause I remember when we were doing our designs, our, our, sorry, our, our sizing. And we said, I remember just asking like, well, how do you like, I don't know, like a B cup and like what size bottom? And they're like this size. I'm like, well, how do you know? I mean, people are like uniform. They're like, well, that's just how you sell. I'm like, but how could that fit? It, it, so these are these are dumb questions, you know, because you just did it this way. But it's the best. And, it's the best question because that is completely true. Right, right. And this is at a time where people didn't really sell separates. You know, you just because why? So you follow the thread a little more, and it's because the boutique owner, the person, you know, at the end of the year has what like two of this size, one of this size. What do they do with it? They don't want to be stuck with it. Right, and inventory costs are just higher, but. You know, that's thinking in the wrong direction. That's not thinking about your consumer. That's thinking about your you as the business owner, right? Um, I think there's something to that. that you know, the dumb questions uh, being sometimes the best ones. But I don't know. It's it, that's well, interesting. I mean, I'll tell you later in my story. Like, I mean, I know I'm just gonna I'll, I'll just I'll circle back. But like, you know, a lot of what I've done the last eight nine years is buy out or turn around bankrupt businesses or businesses in succession. And they've been like, like industrial water filters for like the Atlanta aquarium, like big like shit. I know nothing about, you know, high end guitars, like, you know, the Prada guitars, boutiques and like, just like things that are just like, and so a lot of my career, you know, this thing like the imposter syndrome where you like, you feel like you don't belong. Like, I don't know. I kind of was an imposter. <laughs> I was, it was even a syndrome. Like I had no business in a lot of these industries and businesses I was a part of. 
And I think it's bec- and I and I think the first thing I did I was just acknowledge I just had no idea, you know. And that's that's pretty disarming because when when you just say when you just lay that up front, but you know you um, my whole thing was I just I know how to get people to like really do amazing things together that I can do everything else. You know, I, I'm a quick study, but, but so anyway, my whole career has been asking these questions and, um, I get it. I get, I get why that would make people that generally makes most people really uncomfortable because you're exposing, you know, you, you don't know. And, but, uh, but I think once you get over that, there's, there's, there's such a unique, uh, value to becoming at something fresh and, um, and what the courage to to consider doing it in a way it hasn't been done before. Yeah, I love it. Um, I also think the imposter syndrome is sometimes a good thing because if you're not trying to strive, you know, a level or two up, you're probably yeah. being stagnant, right? And that's also why a lot of times sure. high achieving people have it because they're always striving upwards and like realize they're, that they're in over their head a little bit, but yet we're going to figure it out. So um, continue on your story. So just, I think this is great. Just keep on going wherever you want to go after the swimsuit. Where what happened next? Yeah, one thing I'll just add to the your imposter thing. I just one something I heard on an NPR podcast once was uh, they said you know the, the 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 president of the United States had no training to be president of the United States. I mean, so think about like the the, the arguably the most important job in the world, or the you know the toughest job in the world. And there's no school for it. I mean, the person was just a, a businessman before or a senator before or whatever, you know? So talk about like imposter syndrome. Talk about learning curve. Yeah. And usually the two people up up for presidential nominees are usually people that have never had been president before. So it's always going to happen, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so Vito So took off. You know, I ended up moving to the south of France. Um, so one of the mistakes we made was... Um, we just, we were like U S focused and we realized our swimsuits were good for New York, Miami, Southern California. That's about it. Like we were not, I don't know, middle America was just not going to like the stuff that we had, but when we were at our swimsuit show, swim, the Miami swim show, that was our first show. Um, we had people from like Europe and South America. They were just losing their minds over what we had in, okay. Miss France, you know, Costa Rican designer, John and I, Jamaican. Yeah. Okay. That makes like, okay, duh. Right. And so we, um, Elizabeth Hurley, she has got a swimsuit line and she, um, she pulled out of a show in, uh, and I think it was Harrogate in the UK, a big, really well-known lingerie show. And, um, so we, we snapped her spot. And I think within, I don't know, 24, 36 hours, I was on a plane, um, to, to London and uh, with a whole bunch of samples and set up our booth and we sold to, um, you know, I made a sale to Harrods. So now we had like, I mean, this is, we haven't even really produced some suits before, right? Like we produce samples, you know? So, uh, so anyway, the long and short of it is, it was just a, a crazy ramp up and um, I ended up in the South of France, sort of focusing on the European market because I spoke French and, um, and the rest of the team worked on uh, on North America, uh, and it was great. You know, we 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 really took off. Um, I ended up exiting a couple years in. Um, it's like I don't know. I guess I look. It was my first gig out of college. You know, and I, I hadn't really thought beyond. And uh, there was a lot of things I, was, I would have done differently. How I sort of structured a partnership. What you know, and it just it really wasn't working with the three of us and it just kind of made seem like it'd be better if it was just a husband and the wife, you know, and this was the, this was the wife's thing, frankly, you know, I, I think I just, I, I think I created her like dream job post, you know, being a beauty queen. And so, um, so I exited to them. I think I was like 24 at the time. Now I was like, I don't know, in the South of France and in, in Nice now, I think, um, in the, you know, burning through my cash too fast. It's easy to do that in that area. And so, um, I, I didn't know what to do really. And so I just, um, I got some advice. I was going to do my MBA. I want to, li- I want to stay in France and, um, uh, long story short, I went to Paris. I met some biz school alumni and, uh, somebody offered me a job at Dan and yogurts of all places. And I was like, I don't know, first thing to yogurt. Like I eat it, but like, <laughs> what on earth would I do here? And um, 
I don't know. I just took it. I liked the woman a lot who was um, who was hiring me, and so I ended up doing two years. I had a, I had a global role f- for like Danin Group, Danin, second biggest company in Fran- in Europe, no France, um, uh, and. Uh, you know, we what we did was like culture and organizational development and post merger integration and like, uh, but you know, across a hundred thousand people and like a hundred eleven countries and you know, I, I had to like get a haircut and like not wear purple shirts anymore. Like this wasn't fashion, you know. It's like it was like a metamorphosis. This is in the opera neighborhood in Paris and um, and that was hard because it was I I it's, it was kind of like. You, yeah, what is it? The Chinese, they have these like wooden shoes and you put your feet in these wooden shoes so that it reforms your foot, mm-hmm. you know, by force. That's what it kind of felt like, you know, because I just wasn't, I had never thought I'd work for a large corporation. But um, so, real quick, but it was the- I want to ask you about you said you would wish you would have re, uh, done your partnership differently for the swimsuit company. Yeah. Well, what, it, it, you know, as much as you can or want to share, like, what did you learn there? Because I think a lot of people are doing startups and a lot of people that listen to the podcast are wanting to do startups. And I actually have, I mean, I actually want to know that better because, you know, probably my next gig will probably have a technical co-founder, right? So it's very interesting, right? And we, I've read a lot of things, listened to a lot of things, but at the end of the day, I just really don't know, right? Man, it's such yeah. No, I'm happy to share. It's a, it's such a balancing act between um, like you can't dial in everything when you just have an idea and a name and you're just kind of starting out. But you do have to plan for success and and get clear and acknowledge that it can be a challenging conversation and there's compromise. But guess what? It's the first good opportunity to start compromising and coming to agreements. And you have to do that a lot. And I think if you skip out on that one, um, uh, you'll skip out on other tough, seemingly, you know, challenging. They're tough. They can be tough conversations. And, and, uh, and I think that's what I didn't do. I didn't do that. You know, I was like, I was like, I just, I was graduating biz school, I think it's 21 or 22. And, uh, there was, it was super exciting. And so I said, whatever. And I remember reaching out to a biz school professor and asking him about that. And you remember he, him saying like, you know, you, like it's your first deal, you know, don't, um, don't like, uh, it, it was like, don't, don't, don't like ask for the moon or anything. Just get it done, have a success. Uh, and I did it. I, frankly, I just, I didn't. And, um, and so it just wasn't really, clear and i mean so what happened was when we got really successful things changed like, mm-hmm. you know, like my, my partner he didn't really care about the, i mean I don't know, he threw money at it he wrote checks he kind of checked in but whatever he was doing he had other things going on you know but now we're like we're, we're cr- every magazine you know we're making custom-made swimsuits for like like ricky martin calls us up too bad it's only for women you know we're just like we're we're bosses you know all of a sudden out of nowhere and so he just started leaning in and getting more involved and like they want to they want to change sort of the like our whole thing was putting beautiful swimwear on the inside bikinis and it was like your personal secret it was like an intimate secret you know that's what made us special and this was like 2005 when like Dove was just coming out with beautiful women and all, like we were like way ahead like right there with that movement you know and, and that's our whole thing like making people feel beautiful from the inside out and so you know, we had like creative differences. Like they wanted to like, I think it was Saks. They were like, okay, well, can you make them reversible? And they're like, sure. <laughs> you know, I'm like, no, 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 what do you mean? I was yeah. like, our whole ethos is not that, you know? And I get it. You know, he, he he's, I don't know. It's uh, sometimes, you know, people, it's, look, this is a reality. And I'm going to sort of share this with you and share this with your owners. I think the reason why contracts and agreements are really important is to protect both people because you just don't know how you're going to react if someone comes and gives you, shows you a big check. You can't know, you know? And mm-hmm. so contracts are there and agreements are there to protect everyone uh, and to sort of keep us on track or to, um, it's for those situations, really. It's like a helmet. You never really want it, but. Well, Gary, Gary <laughs> Keller of uh, Keller, Keller Williams um, calls them disagreements instead of agreements. Cause really you're only going to pull it out when you disagree. <laughs> And I think that's, that's a, a great point. way to look at it because I would write it differently if I want to talk about what I'm going to disagree on, right? 
Um, so it, it is interesting. And I do think, yeah, when things change, you know, where do I, where do you stand? Right. And, um, that can be tough. Uh, mm-hmm. but you know, mm-hmm. there's also some, something powerful about, about jumping in. So, you know, I think mm-hmm. it's kind of similar. What we were talking about earlier about like having all this gear and doing everything, but like, is that going to slow you down too much? It's great if you can balance it, you know, where, where you're, you're going to be motivated, but also, um, I don't know, check all the boxes you need to check. Um, <laughs> So it's that balance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, corporate stuff. So corporate America, like I assume that was something though, that gave you some things you would have never learned in anything uh, you want to share about a stint in corporate America, because there's kind of, it kind of gets a bad rap nowadays, but I, and I didn't love my stint at a big company, but I also learned a ton. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so this was, this is corporate France. And so this was very, it was like the opposite of what I'd learned in business school. Look, I'll give you one fundamental difference between Europe and especially France and North America. In Europe, if you're hired for a job, if you're hired at a company, um, you've got a lifetime gig. It's very difficult to fire you. Whereas I remember, you know, in my factory in South Carolina, I can fire someone because, because. So it's like a world of a difference. And so what that does is the way the culture and the way sort of the mentality at Bannon um, when I was there worked was that they wanted to like make you want to be there. They make it, they were appealing. They were appealing to your emotions. They were appealing and they cared and they were, they were interested. That was like the goal. And that ran through the company. Like it wasn't a top down company. Like my, my role was, um, global training, um, manager of like global training. So I had like people who like ran training budgets and training programs for the company all over the the world, 46 of them. And I was at the head office of Paris. I couldn't tell them what to do. I had to like convince them. I had to influence them, you know, I had to engage them. And so things like that and a whole bunch of other things, I think that's one of the biggest things I learned was like, how do you get people to care? How do you get people to like really want to be there? How do you appeal to like someone's emotional um, desire to like lean in and care? And look, I mean, I I wish you could see me at the time. I was just not fit for a corporate role, especially in France. I mean, France is a structured, structured place. And, um, you know, you basically got to go to HEC, like the equivalent of French Harvard, to get into some of these companies. And so it was – but. I don't know. They won me over and I'm still won over. I still buy Dana products. And I think, I think that's sort of the biggest thing. And I, and frankly, I, I, for the large part, I know corporate and corporate North America maybe doesn't do that, including Canada, you know, maybe even Mexico. I just, I know that, I just know that people don't, um, people are adopting it a lot more now, but that's, that's the biggest thing that I learned is how to, um, get people to care from like, a way they, they've maybe rarely cared about something other than they're like themselves and their family. I mean, and just, you know, being an American born here and always lived here is like, and I get that. And as a business owner, I would want my employees to do that, but it is interesting just to even hear that, that like that was so ingrained into the culture. Cause that's just not the way it is here. Right. Uh, um, because you could fire someone, people are disposable in general, you know, there you, you're, it's a marriage. You're stuck with them or, or it's a, it's a pretty, it's pretty expensive to get rid of people. And especially if you've got a hundred. And I think, so those are like the rational practical reasons, but I know like Fong Kibu was the, the CEO when I was there. And then, so his father, I can't remember his name, but he, he was, he, he wrote this book called like in the seventies, like uh, society, um, a company's role in society. Uh, the translation and like, in the seventies. I mean, this guy wow. was like thinking about this, like it, it was who he was. So there's that element too. There's like, you know, the practical rational reasons, but also cause shit, you just care. And, and I think that was a big thing. And to, 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 for that to like go across a hundred thousand people, like, you know, that was part of my job to like instill this. We buy a company, we bought this Dutch company, 25,000 employees. Boom. How do you get them on the same track? How do you, merge them with this sort of culture. So that was a big, that was probably the biggest thing I've learned um, is, uh, is how to, inst- how, how to like create that and instill that um, with people. So then 
my guess is your story goes into something on your own after the, after you left Dan. And is that mm-hmm. is is that the case? And you know, walk us through how you left and 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 what you did. Yeah, I mean, um, truth is, is like you know, in a way, I had a very sort of cush life. You know, I lived in the center of Paris. I had like you know, um, a girlfriend I really liked, and uh, travel the world and all that. And I don't know. I just felt I felt like I was on this sort of linear trajectory, and and uh, yeah, and I guess I missed like I think I just missed like kind of not being on a linear trajectory and just sort of carving out something that was unpredictable. Because um, in large part, I was really set. And I was set for like uh, a fairly exceptional life, especially in the context of like Europe and France, you know. Um, but anyway, um, but here's the other thing is, frankly, like I also knew that I wasn't happy. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't, and it, and it wasn't just the job because I worked with great people. I worked at a great company. I traveled the, like, the world, like, wasn't hard, you know, and, uh, but I wasn't happy and I knew it just had to do with something like inside. And, um, and I was really, I was at a weird place because I was like, I live in Paris. I've got all these things going on. I've done the entrepreneurial thing. I've done the corporate thing. I don't think I'm going to find a better corporate scenario than this. It was pretty unique. Um, and I'm not happy. So I need to like figure this out because, you know, I'm only like 27, 26 now. And like, I need to like, I don't know. I need to like kind of get that right. And so it wasn't a direct path, but uh, the long, I mean, I ended up in Boulder, Colorado of all places, you know, and like, it's, it's, it's almost cliched. Right. But like, I ended up there after like, I eventually left Dan. I moved to Buenos Aires. I like, you know, I, I, so these are like the the stuff in between. Like I I learned to play polo. Like I just thought I just did like, all this like kind of fun stuff. I try to kind of mask with fun stuff. I like doing really fun stuff. And, um, and, and I don't know, I just wasn't really, nothing was really getting there. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I spoke with a clairvoyant, you know, someone, someone put me onto this clairvoyant and this blew my mind. The stuff he talked about, like stuff he would say was just like, it was shocking. Like how like, like acutely specific he was like insecurities with my girlfriend and like but specific ones. And, and so anyway, he just suggested I should probably go and do like a personal deep dive. And that's what I did. And I ended up in Boulder and I did everything, man. I did like Zen. I went to a psychic school. I did like the Pashanas. You know what those are? Like the 10 day silent meditation retreats. Oh yeah. Yeah, actually I do. I, I, I had somebody else on the uh, podcast that that was a major life changing thing for him where he was an engineer, uh, engineer that totally went a right turn, a whole right angle. That's what, yeah, that's that's what it was like for me. And so I did that for about a year. And uh, it was hard, man, because I was like so ambitious and so like I cared about 28 or 29. How, like, I, should, I should always be further. Whatever I've done, I should always be further. Like that kind of thing. And, and so to, to not do anything and to kind of become like a little bolder hippie for a year or so, I was like... I was like, the, like so, so weird, uh, but so wonderful and so helpful. And um, eventually, um, I don't know, I like, I kind of decided I want to kind of re-enter the, the, the business world and just kind of, I don't know, I feel like I got in what I wanted. I just kind of like a sense of just, just, I don't know, clarity. I used to have a really hard time concentrating. I used to be like super ADD. Mm-hmm. You know, in France, I worked at like, like Dan and I to like take Ritalin just to like you know, stay on track, you know? And like, and you can't find that shit in France. You know, for them, it's like, it's like the worst. Like here you get, it's like Tic Tacs, you know? But there, that, that culture does not really endorse these things. And so, and uh, so anyway, these are things that led to that. And um, coming out of that, um, uh, I ended up getting, I ended up hooking up with a CEO that I knew from Canada. He was doing a turnaround of Boston Market. You know the rotisserie chicken companies? Oh, yeah. This is like 2010, uh, maybe, no, maybe it's like 11, 12 now. And um, I don't know, we had coffee, we were talking about culture and this, I was talking about Dan and he really liked what I had to say and he asked me if I'd help him with the turnaround of this company, you know, and and uh, so, yeah, I'm just like laughing because now I was still like, this is like semi hippie ties. I saw like a long hair. I'd wear a ponytail and hiking boots. I'd roll into these corporate offices. And, uh, but we did amazing things, man. We did amazing, like this. So, like maybe a, 
I don't know, maybe like two, a third or two thirds of the company had been laid off. And so people were in shell shock and they'd gone to a bankruptcy and all this crazy shit. So like people were like, he wanted people to go from surviving to thriving as a mentality. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what I did was, um, a lot of stuff I'd learned at Danon, frankly, like those kind of the workshops I started running at Danon and how to kind of create that breakthrough thinking and how to create like sense of trust and psychological safety to just share ideas in like the most like free flowing open way, you know, and um, crazy things happen, man. Like, like we had like people internally, we had these, like, they were like, they're called breakthrough sessions. So we do these things to like try to like, induce an epiphany in that half day workshop, like a breakthrough idea. We came up with things like f like home food delivery. This is like 2012, right? And so one woman, the regional manager went back to like Florida and she invested like her own cash. This is like regional manager in like a Boston market chain, you know, a company to try the idea. So she was acting like an entrepreneur, like mm -hmm. within the company. And that was like a real aha moment for me. I was like, wow, we're getting like employees that think like entrepreneurs here. And uh, so I kept kind of doing those those gigs, and um, what I soon found out was that the um, I started kind of finding myself working with like older business owners, retiring age business owners, and and I kind of felt like, man, like they're so they're always complaining about their employees. They're kind of the problem, actually. You know, like the culture is they're the issue, the leadership. And I I, I eventually found out that if I could just like replace them. Because I was having success and traction with these companies. But I'm like, man, if I could just get rid of that guy I and I could just do what I need to do, we could probably get there way faster. And um, and so I kind of went downstream and started looking for like 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 Boston Market. It's a $500 million company. You know, that's a private equity deal. So I kind of went down to like smaller little businesses with retiring business owners who I could take over and, uh, and run their and, – um, and participate somehow uh, from an equity standpoint. Um, so, could have, so you have a little, transition, or so you have a little more leverage though, because you wanted you wanted to be able to make stronger changes. Perhaps it sounds like. Yeah, like I didn't. The title of CEO didn't matter for me, but the authority of a CEO mattered to me. Right. Because because I just knew it worked, and I knew like what what that could look like if I didn't have to do spend fifty percent of my time trying to politically maneuver the the old guy you know um it's funny because actually i was gonna say old guy and girl but it's actually typically the old guys right. you know the in situations where there's a husband and a wife the wives are you typically more reasonable actually <laughs> but um yeah i don't know i just started looking for deals and i just i'll take anything you know and i just and it's weird so this is like maybe another thing that could could be resonate with your bro i just kind of decided i was gonna be a ceo Sure. It's kind of the president of the United States thing. I just decided I'm just going to go and become a CEO of this company. And you can decide that. It's not going to happen the next day. But there is this thing about like believing in it and getting to the point where I believed in it to the point where it was ingrained. That took a year and a half or two years almost Like while I was searching. And every time I tell someone, oh, like a broker or someone, like here's what I'm looking for. Here's what I want to do. It ingrains it a little more. It ingrains a little more and putting it out I in know, the you universe, just, you, you know, you put it out there and it, it just hap It does happen. Uh, now you still got to walk the walk when you get there, but if you never believed in doing it or also like really wanted to do it, it might happen, but most likely it probably won't. Yeah. And the thing is, and I didn't believe it. Like I didn't just say it today and believe it tomorrow. Like, like I'd say it a lot, Felt like it felt, felt fraudulent. I mean, that didn't feel real. But I did kept saying it. I did kept saying it until like one time, like I'm looking for deals. I'm doing consulting gigs to you know make cash. And um, there was one bankrupt company, and uh, and I told the owner that uh, he wanted to shut it down. And I said, no, no, I want to invest in this and take this over, and I'll, I'll float the company. You know the. You don't have to put any more money in it. Here's, you know, we kind of structured a deal. I'll take like 40% of the upside if it sells, if it doesn't, whatever. I don't want a salary. And he goes, what's, what's your role going to be? You know, this is like a 78-year-old like steel tycoon. And this is like one of his like little manufacturing companies. And so at that point, I had to believe enough to say, I'll be CEO and, uh, and co-owner with you. 
um, and to like own that and then silence. Mm -hmm. And not say anything. Yeah. Just put it, let it, let it sit in the air. (laughs) And, um, my wife and I do this a lot. We, we will role play a little bit, especially when she was going through some job interviews and stuff. And and even just with big meetings, because if you sit there and you're prepared for that tough, that crazy question that comes at you and you want to give the right answer. And I help a lot of friends when they're like going through some jobs, when I was negotiating money. And I tell them a number, which they first ask them how much they want to make. Okay, I'm like, okay, let's like double that or something, right? 50% more or whatever. Yeah. And just keep saying that over and over and over and over. So when yeah. it just falls out of your mouth, it's the right number that falls out of your mouth or the right position or, or right thing, as opposed to uh, downgrading yourself. Because I think we all downgrade ourselves if we haven't been prepared for that situation. Anyway. You, listen, man, you're, 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 you're a hundred percent right. And, um, it's, uh, yeah, I think that the, the role playing and getting into the feeling of it, I mean, that's, it's actually a lot more about convincing yourself. That's like the irony of it. Cause once you believe it, then others will believe you. But if you don't believe it, then you haven't even really, can't really take really the first step. And, and I think the easiest place to, to understand is, is usually your compensation, your money and stuff like that, and, and your position, your title. Those yeah, are easy yeah. ones. There's so many other places we could take this. You know, you could take this in sports. Mm-hmm. You could take it to a lot of different places, relationships, dating, all that stuff. But, um, you know, that's one thing is, you know, if you're doing a role and you think you're undercompensated, it's probably your fault <laughs> and it, because you just haven't it's, believed it's 100%. it. It's 100%. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're right. And that that's a tough pill to swallow, but it's the best pill to swallow because once you've swallowed it and you let that now now the power back is back in your hands. It's better if it was in somebody. It's it's better than if it was in somebody else's. You know. Well, and that's somebody why people complain because they believe it's yeah, not their I fault, know. right? Uh, yeah. And you know, you don't hear somebody complaining when they know it's their fault and they're trying to do something about it, right? But uh, ownership is a tough thing, man. Owning, owning, like taking responsibility and just owning like your decisions and where you're at. And it's, um, it's kind of, you know, it's also, it's why I like the Vipassana too, because you, when you go there, you sit there in silence, 10 days, 10 hours a day for 10 days and shit comes up, man. And you can't, you can't go put on Netflix. You can't have a drink. You can't go skiing and get your mind off of it. You, do, you just, you have to face it. It doesn't really get easier, but you get better at it, I guess. And and I think you also understand how to process your thoughts, quiet your brain when you need it to, or all this because you, you've, it's a muscle that you're, you're working on. And I think, yeah, that whole thing, let's just grab our phone or Netflix when a thought comes up you're just weakening that muscle of, of under, you know, yeah. or, or laying in bed and getting on your phone or something as opposed to, okay, how, should mm-hmm. I download my thoughts of the day or how do I quiet my brain so I can actually get, you know, some good rest. Man, ten, you did, did that for like a month though, right? You said? No. So it's, so it's a 10 day silent ten, retreat. Ten so day. you go, so you did, you're there kind of 11 days in total oh. um, from the first, when you arrive and you leave, but yeah, your phone's, you, you give away, you hand over your phone. You should. Uh, it's actually not good to keep it because the temptation is too too strong to to take a look. Um, you uh, you don't have anything to write. You don't have anything to read. You don't you don't you don't make eye contact with anybody. You just you're you know actually the not talking is actually not the hardest part. Frankly, that's what everybody freaks out about. But it's it's sitting there and something uh, you know something comes up in your mind, a memory, a thought, uh, a decision you may have made, and you just have to like stare at it and like until it just kind of, um, you know, they teach you a process and you, what you learn, what you look, the, ass- the essence of what you learn is not to crave and not to, uh, to come out of craving and aversion. Craving is like, Oh, I really want that motorcycle. Oh, I need to have that motorcycle. Oh, if I don't have it, I'm going to be, Oh, I'm going to be so upset if I don't have it replace motorcycle with anything, you know, or, um, or a version, you know, I, I remember once I was uh, telling this story to uh, talking about Vipassana like this at a cafe in Toronto with a buddy in the summer. And I, said, I can't make this up. This, this bee came and sat on my hand and stung me. And I was like, ah, and I'm like, for example, like I just got stung. I'm like in the conversation talking about this. I'm like, and he, I'm like, like, I feel like a sharp, feeling i should feel sharp pain but i'm not 
I'm not resisting it. It's just, it's just there. I'm accept. It's just there. I'm not like, I don't wish it didn't happen. I don't. And it's an interesting thing. Cause when you do that, you don't, you get your head out of the game. You're not amplifying it. You're not making things worse. So you're not, so you're not, and craving an aversion leads to suffering. That's what you learn. And the things that, and the fact that everything's always changing. So you spend 10 hours a day, 10 days there, like scanning your body. And your mind becomes so quiet that you can feel the cellular movements under your skin. It's crazy. It's like the, it's, it's so wild, man. And like, you see, and it's quiet and you like, you become like hypersonic, like everything. You know, you walk in the woods, you get to go on walks and you can like hear a chipmunk from like way over there. Like you just, you wow. develop these like senses. Yeah. And, um, but you just, you start untangling your mind and things just become really clear, but you're also happier. You're just not resisting or you're not reacting to things as much. Is it similar so, to like when you're camping and like it takes about a day or hiking, you know, and camping like a more uh, difficult mm. process. And then about a day and a half, you kind of start settling in, right? You start understanding, mm -hmm. okay, this is the new life or whatever, but you're fighting it and you're pushing and pulling all over the place and not really... Mm. You know, it's that I think over after you get over that hump, then you start really liking it and then you miss the world, the other world. But then you go back to it. And you're like, wait a second. I kind of enjoyed what I was just doing there in the, you know, in the middle of nowhere. But 100 percent. And I, I mean, that's why actually people because when I tell my friends I'm a big promoter of this uh, of this Vipassana and I, I tell people about it and they say, I can't you just do it for two days, three days. I'm like, man. It takes about four days just to get to the doorway. Yeah. You know, just to be able to step inside. Four days is like really when it starts. You just like, you get quiet enough to just start feeling how, it, what, the thing is you're, you're, you're scanning your body. You, you're seeing all the, and there's a lot going on in there. And when you can become aware of it, it's pretty wild to observe it. Like all the cellular movements and everything. And to, you realize your body is impermanent and you, it's, it's constantly changing. And it's like, and so you see the world that way. It's like, it's really something. Yeah. I've done it 10 times. 10 times. I was going to, I was going to be my next question is, you know, is that something that you continue to do or are still going to do? <laughs> it sounds like, yeah, that's 10 times. Wow. And yeah. I've done it every year since that first year. I just kind of, I just committed it to myself that I'm going to do that. And COVID this year, obviously, you know, we, we tried to go to two, three different centers. We we're going to drive across the country to do it. They all shut down. So I went and locked myself up in a hotel room. I did a three day. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm about due to do another one now, actually. Maybe I do this weekend. And um, do you have a goal in mind before you go? Do you like say, okay, I'm, I want a new business idea or like a relationship advice or does it just, I'm just going to go and, and, and let it happen? You know, you, you would think so. Right. And I think maybe some of those things are in the subconscious, but they, uh, What's interesting is that would almost um, diminish what's possible. Right. It, it, it's, it's, you know, it's like they use this example in Vipassana. They're like, you don't make a, a sugar factory just to make molasses. You don't make a molasses factory. You make a sugar factory and one of the things is molasses. So that's kind of the, the breadth of, of, you know, what you get out of this um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I got super clarity, like, you know, I, I was working on a deal, a roll up, we we're like rolling up all these real estate companies and, um, kind of fell apart right before I went in. So, you know, my mind was in a spin, man. And like, and I'd also just written a book, uh, and I released it and I developed like this, this course based on it. And it was like getting amazing feedback, but I was doing nothing with it. Cause I was kind of focused. I was like doing maybe too many things. I just wasn't really kind of so I, in one of the things like that I got from the Vipassana was I just like folk, put my mind on this for 90 days and just like give it everything I've got. And that's a little bit hard for me, frankly, just to kind of focus on, on one thing. It's, uh, it's hard a little bit for me to do that. But, um, but anyway, so that was one of the, the outcomes of this, this, this last one. I mean, I, I absolutely love those side conversations because, you know, we could talk about, and I want to, <laughs> want to get back to the business end of it, but um, it's just interesting of how I think the older we get, the more we realize, at least for me, that there's it's life isn't just one tract, right? We got to go a lot of different ways. We got to increase what we're doing here and there, and be able to. I don't, I don't. Let me let me actually come at it a different way. 
I think especially with all the social media stuff that we just had with this last presidential campaign, there was a lot of people having a lot of, and, and COVID had a lot of anger and anguish and all this and didn't know how to express those feelings or get rid of them mm. or quiet them or work through them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I just think stuff like that, being able to be good at that things can make you have, you would never have a super, super happy life if that pillar of your life isn't at least somewhat worked on or have some attention. Um, hundred percent, man. I mean, that, I mean, you just said the word it, it's happiness, right? I mean, that's, that's the goal. And that's what I think about a lot all the time is like, the goal is to feel good. You know, that's a bottom line. It's to feel good. And there's different conduits of that. It's a relationship can make you feel really good or really bad. You know, um, health does make you feel good. Uh, relationships don't make you feel good. Money makes you, well, the money you can buy things with right. makes you feel good. But I, the, the know, lack of money makes you feel bad. But <laughs> that lack of money makes you feel bad because of all, all, all the things that that sort of, um, you know, all the things that, uh, that introduces so but the thing is is like what's the balance you know because you, you you lean in too hard and just dollars and then you're just not doing things you like anymore you're not you know and and what are the sources of that happiness and that's um a mental clarity helps you realize those things because it's e very easy to get lost and to go down a road and just think that uh it's 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 more zeros you know and, and let's let me ask a specific question on it you know, going into these retreats and kind of understanding more about yourself and all that, how has that um, helped you business-wise besides just ideas? I think ideas mm -hmm. is definitely something that probably comes out of it, but any other uh, items where it just really has helped and you've noticed it? Yeah. I mean, look, uh, I'd say probably the, the largest part of my success has been able to turn around. I turn around businesses that are essentially good for dead or uh, unfixable, you know, and or transitioning family businesses out of succession. Like that's really hard stuff and involves a lot of people and like emotions. And um, it's given me something I just never really had was patience, patience and, and, and understanding and compassion and just people feel those things, man. You know, and if you if you can guide people through difficult processes and be the calmest person in the room, if you, when you don't know if you're going to make payroll for like a hundred factory workers, the next day, uh, 60% of them are ex cons, you know, some of them for murder. So like, you're just like, I don't know. You just like, if you're the calmest person, everybody calms down and you can, um, you could really steer and, um, and, and, and frankly, I, I get off of that, actually. I get off of, of like being the calmest person in like a complete shit show and uh, not being reactive. It's like, I don't know. It's like being this like, uh, it's like being this uh, an anchor, you know, in like a, in, a, in a storm, you know. And so that's one of the biggest things I got. So that patience and that like groundedness, because that was just not me before. Um very reactive, very, you know, I was ego driven and I don't know, you, you, I was easily offendable before, very mm -hmm. easily offendable. And, uh, and the other thing is concentration and discipline. You know, I can, I can like focus, I can like zoom in and man, I just, I just really didn't have that faculty before. It, and it was terrible just not to be able to like keep your mind on one thing and kind of focus on something, you know? Yeah. And I think I, this might somewhat be re related. You said earlier that you, you know, ski or snowboard just about every day. How, how do you, how, you know, walk us through kind of a, a normal day in the life and, you know, and does that skiing and all that, like, how can you manage that time? Right. And, and what's it actually, I'm guessing there's some be benefits to that too, as well. Yeah, it's interesting. So, um, I've, uh, you know, we talked about like feeling good and being happy and that's like the goal. And, and, and you and I both know that the more you feel good, then, you know, then the more great things you can create. And if you're, if you're like stressed and all tensed up or whatever, you can't really produce good things. You're not going to have very inspiring meetings to people. You're not going to have big, great ideas. And, um, obviously at different stages, you can do that in different ways. Like, you know, when I, I sold my businesses, uh, three years ago and um and i just decided i wanted to work remotely at that point and i just didn't want to sort of i i, I was a little burnt out from turnarounds i just had done two like really really tough ones at the same time and so um 
and so I started traveling and working. And so I, I, I created this like, um, I started working on like a process on how to scale culture change because what I wanted to do was raise a fund to to buy out retiring business owners and transform their businesses into employee owned businesses. I'm I'm super passionate about like ESOPs and employee ownership and all that, and I want to scale that. And a big part of that is culture change and doing all that. So, I spent the last two three years doing that, and and I was doing that. I was like going to a different country every month, you know. So I was in Barcelona one month, and Paris one month, and but I was working, you know, and and. Uh, when you're in Barcelona, you can work from three to like nine. That's basically like, you know, the USA, I think New York's like working hours more or less. And so, and it's just fine because you, you have dinner at 11 anyway. <laughs> and if you go out, like, uh, with, I, lo- I love that uh, W hotel on the beach there in Barcelona. That, that is, uh, that's a good Sunday, time, man. Sunday nights. Yeah, that yeah. Was like the when you get, you get there at like two in the morning or whatever is when you start the night. <laughs> so good. Yeah, man, I just, it's interesting because as I just realized I was operating at a much higher level, like my ideas and my feeling. And I remember like walking through like the Gothic neighborhood back to my apartment from like the Soho house where I used to like one or two spin classes a day, you know, I was like hardcore at it. And it just like endorphins and all that, you know. Uh, and I was just thinking like, what's the price of like this? Like, what would I, like versus like having to walk in, like what would I, What's this worth to me, really? Mm-hmm. This kind of like being able to be in where I want to be in. Um, and this feeling of how, how, how inspired and happy I felt and, and, and all that. So um, I think uh, feeling great um, can, leads to more feeling great. You know, I've, I've got a, one of my buddies from my, uh, my YPO chapter and he uh, – he goes to he goes to Necker Island a fair bit, you know, Richard Richard Branson's island. And, and he like and he was just telling me once, he's like, Man, the guy just plays all the time. And yeah, he's a billionaire and all, but because he's working, but he's playing volleyball, but he's like talking to his associates and he's like doing things. And I understand that's a very extreme example, but it was just very validating for me to hear that because all I want to do is live in a ski resort, you know, at least half a year and just ski every day. And I'm like, look, I go for a walk or I go work out for an hour and a half every day. I just try to go skiing. Cause that's the best way. I f- that's when I feel my best. Like I just, you know, it's probably an addiction at this point. <laughs> <I just love it. laughs> what, what, what's your favorite mountain? Man. So I know Vail is like my home mountain. Like I just, I know Vail inside out. Like I could just, I could go there two weeks after a snowstorm and still find like, knee deep powder. Um, and so I really, really, really like Vail. I'm partial to that. I, so we just moved to Park City from Vail in November. Uh, so I'm really liking canyons a lot. Mm-hmm. Man, I'm partial to Vail. What can I tell you, man? It's just yeah, Colorado's it's, it's like, got the best. I mean, uh, I, I, uh, I just over the summer, I uh, mountain biked down Vail. I haven't done that mm. before. <laughs> that was killer. Um, I'm Parts of the steamboat because uh, there's a music fest that happens every mm-hmm. January. It didn't happen this year. And that's, that's just like my favorite week of the year is that you got all these concerts and I, um, I have this, uh, it's called steamboat late night and I get invited to these parties su- super late. And if you look it up on YouTube, they all have like hundreds of thousands of views. Cause it's like these Texas country musicians that are, famous in texas but not really anywhere else and they're just sitting mm. on the guitar uh, they're just passing the guitar around and then you you know you go to bed at four or five and you wake up at like eight to go hit the slopes and you're just yeah. your, your body can only take so many days like yeah. you're just done <laughs> but uh i steamboat's great and i think there's you know we tie emotions to stuff like it has it been always my best skiing probably not but actually probably some of my worst skiing because the legs aren't there but um so you're a skier. Um, yeah, ski always ski, always half, never boarded. Uh-huh. So um and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna change because I like the skiing and I don't want to waste a trip. I go at least once a year. Um I'd like to go more often. My brother in law's in Denver and they go about seventy times a year. Mm-hmm. Um so from De- from Denver? Yeah, he lives, yeah. So he's always he's 70 like, times from Denver. Yeah, wow. to, to the different places, right? So they just wherever wow. it gets snow, they just hit it, right? And they have all the passes. And um but Amazing. he's the only boarder I know that is like faster than me on my skis. Right. He is wow, in wow. through the trees and everything. He's, he's unreal. But, um, anyway, I've, I've always, there's always something about being on the mountain. That's for sure. I mean, look, look, look how it makes like you and I like, like, you yeah. know, this kind of this, this energy, this, 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 this spark that it gives us. And 
you know, it, it took me a while to really accept and realize this, but like, it's okay to feel good and it's okay to feel happy and it's okay to feel energized and inspired. Even if you're still working on your next goal, you don't have to suffer through it really big, like all the whole time because there's always a next goal and, and you spend all your time in between goals always. And I also think, and this is what I'm working on believing. And I do think it's true is we only need one or two good ideas a year. Like if mm, you have that, point. That's, you don't need 4,000 of them. You don't need one every week, every day. Cause you, you know, mm. you know, and we're talking about big, bigger ideas. And, um, if you don't give yourself a moment to come up with those, cause we get so bogged down with our tasks, right. That you'll never, you'll never come up with those, you know, those ideas that are outside of what you're, what you're seeing every day. Right. But, mm -hmm. and I think sometimes going where, whether it's going skiing, going to a retreat or it's laying on a beach for some people or whatever it is mm -hmm. it, it, and, and, uh, or playing a sport. A lot of times, uh, you know, I get, you know, uh, ideas happen after I'm completely exhausted, you know, mm -hmm. um, so, um, in uh, presence of time, I do want to go a little bit more. So I, I do want to ask, okay, CEO, first time that big Mongol guy that, you know, that you said, Hey, CEO, it sounded like that happened. Uh, how'd that, how'd that company go? How, how'd everything go there? Um, so that was by far the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, I think it was hubris that sort of led me to it because I just, uh, and at this point, I figured that there was something I could, nothing I couldn't do. Um, and um, we, there was a combination of um, uh, really great work um, and, and luck, frankly. We, um, it, it was a fiberglass company that had been around for like, the company had been around for 70 years. It actually built the tip of the CN Tower out of fiberglass. But uh, but anyway, at this point, I was creating, for the last 30 years, industrial water filters. Um, it had moved from Toronto, from outside of Toronto to South Carolina. Uh, they botched a the move, so they couldn't make product on time or on budget for like the last four years. And so they, they were going from the Cadillac to just like the dumpster of uh, the industry. And, um, and so, uh, you know, I was able to... Uh, create the right um, workforce. That, that was a combination of recruiting, but then also the right culture and um, uh, instill an ownership mentality where people just cared and thought about this. And we were kind of all in this together of turning this company around. Um, and so we were able to, just, uh, we were losing about $2 million a year. So we got back to like break even, you know, in about six months. And right around that same time, we did a trade show. Believe it or not, there's a, a world water, uh, what do you call it? Uh, for like a um, water park association. There's a world water park association. There's a, there's a, a conference for that in, in New Orleans. And so we were there and there's an industry player who was like buying up everybody. And, uh, and so we were, we were like a, um, in contention again. And so we got acquired. Wow. That's fantastic. And then so... And, and, and you've kind of gone through a couple of things you've done. What, what, one question I always love to ask is, you know, what's, what's the next five years for you? What, what, what's upcoming for you? Hmm. I think it's, um, look for me, what I've enjoyed the most was, um, uh, creating just, you know, extraordinary, uh, businesses through, um, tapping into um, people's desire to just give of themselves fully and just to sort of pour themselves into it and going from often, often like actively disengaged to just thinking about the business day and night. Um, I've been able to do that as a CEO. And so my next step is to be able to scale that and do that uh, as a fund. And so that's my next step. And um, uh, in order to do that, you know, what I've done is kind of, I've sort of thought a lot about the issue I've had Five years ago with raising a fund was people would say to me, You're you can do it, but a fund is like 10 companies, 15 mm -hmm. companies. You know, how do you do that at scale? And so um and that's what I've been doing for the last four years now, actually, is building a tool that can uh scale culture change like predictably and consistently and, and create that type of environment that where people leave work more energized than when they first arrived because they just uh they gave it 
you know, and you, and I, and I know that you do that for businesses, especially small to mid-sized businesses and you're, you're going to crush it. Oh, so, I mean, it's, it's massively important. What about COVID, the curveball of COVID? How has that changed your approach if it has at all? You know, it hasn't. I mean, uh, what I've like, what I've been sort of focused on, um, is like this, this tool that I was telling you about, like a tool to be able to create uh, culture change. And so what I've done is right now I'm just, I'm refining that tool. So it's a book, it's like an online platform. Um, it creates um, uh, just your highest level of um, voluntary employee turn uh, retention. So how much of your employees leave voluntarily every year? And if, if that number changes dramatically, the tool works. So right now I'm just, I've been focused on doing that. And to your point, just um, uh, riding out COVID a little bit, just so it's a little more predictable of what's going to happen. So um, ensuring my, my tool is sharp and, you know, I've got the, uh, the sort of partners and investors I want to raise this first fund. And basically what we would do is we'd buy out business owners um, and turn their companies. So finance their companies becoming employee owned, lend the company money so it can, bec- so it can buy out its owner and become um, fully owned by its employees. Wow. That's, that's, I mean, that's amazing approach. And I'm guessing probably these more medium sized companies, you know, $10 million, $50 million companies. Is that kind of what you're looking at? Is That's that right. fun? And, yeah. and, and, it, and it also sounds to me that, well, I think there's a massive shift anywhere, anyway, in this uh, environment where a lot of some companies, and we've seen this in the tech world, which typically trickles down to other worlds where if you don't keep your employees happy or make them happy, they, they they'll just, they'll leave so quickly and go someplace else. And it costs so much. I've owned a couple companies and I own one now. And it's just like, it costs so much money to hire somebody, train somebody, <laughs> get them up to speed. And then if they leave a year or two later, it's like ugh, painful. Bro- brother, like I told you, my family's in the French restaurant uh, cafe business. And you know, that industry, the average turnover is 100%, 100 to 110%. That's yeah. like you're replacing everybody every year. I mean, if you keep someone for a couple of years, you're, 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 you know, you're crushing it. But so it's, it's like a, it's a big thing um, everywhere. And you're right. It's it, a lot of people don't realize the, the cost, but once it's, it's almost like a hidden line item on, on the PNL, but it's, it's, it's huge between the, the effort, the time, the recruiting fees, if you go through that or whatever that you go through to find that right person, the mistakes they're going to make because they're new um, and the impact on your customers and then do that again <laughs> X amount of times. And I, I don't know how this might be a difficult question, but like what's something that, you know, somebody who has small or medium sized company or even is higher level in those companies, what's something that they, they can do, right? To just, I don't know, better the company in this kind of way to where employees are more, their morale is bigger. They, they think that they, uh, have a bigger piece of the pie or th- that they're supposed to, what they do matters. Look, I think that the number one thing you can do is to create a sense of psychological trust, to create an environment where people just feel comfortable saying what they actually think. Because if you can't even do that, um, you, I mean, you can't even, you don't even know what's going on. You know, uh, if, if you, if you can't, if you don't create, so the thing that people can do is they can create, you know, what I did with my company is we had these, we had what we called forum meetings once a week for an hour, I had people get together, speak in full confidentiality and share experiences and talked about bit like leadership and growth, but like start building trust that you can say things to each other and they're going to protect it and they're going to respect it. And if you can start creating that. You know, like for example, at the fiberglass company, one like one of the biggest issues is my predecessor there, the guy who was running it before, you, you couldn't say like if there was a, a, a late shipment or something was gonna be late or we missed something, you couldn't say it because he'd freak out. So imagine like you know, like you can't no one's even telling the truth anymore to each other. So Well, uh, and that's the thing, and I, I I'm blanking on the company name. Um I'll think of it as a seventh generation. I was just listening to a podcast and they used to give awards for somebody who messed up the most. Like it was kind of a fun award, funny award because the, you didn't want people hiding the mistakes, right? Cause if they made a mistake and nobody knows about it, then that mistake is going to keep happening mm-hmm. over and over again. Um, what about, um, 
go back, like any advice you'd give your 16 year old self? It's a great question. Journal and keep the journals. And, and why? Um, two reasons. One, when you journal, it's like you get the ideas out of your head out on paper. And uh, so it creates room for more, you know. And then two, um, when you look back, you're going to learn about yourself in a way that you can't by just trying to look back on your memories. It's, it's a transcript of your thoughts and what you're going through. And um, uh, what could be more important than really understanding yourself? I mean, that's that's what this, this whole game's about is just getting who you are and um, and sort of uh, steering yourself to sort of where you want to get to. And this is my last question. I end every podcast with this question is, how would you like to be remembered? For making other people's lives better than it was before they had met me. You know, I think if, if someone, by meeting me, if, they, if they're better off, um, then, 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 then that's how they remember me because they're better off after meeting me. Then, that you know that that would do. I love it. That's definitely <laughs> something we should all aspire to, to be. So, Ahad, it was it was a big pleasure to have you the, on the Establishing Your Empire podcast. A lot of fun. Really, really enjoyed this conversation. So, I really appreciate your time. Me too. No, no, this has been great. I think, uh, uh, you know, on that sort of last note, it's you know, conversations like this help you even. Uh, learn or maybe remember things about yourself and, and it's done that so yeah thank you for uh thank you for the conversation you're welcome cheers cheers